Hello, everyone. This is Ryan from iTry Running Programs, and this is my super in-depth overview of the Hal Higdon Marathon Training Program or the Personal Best Marathon Training Program. And really in this video that I'm calling the kind of athlete primer video, I'm going a little bit more in depth about my own personal methodology using this program. In the overview video that I shared, that is meant to just be the very broad, this is you know kind of the amount of running, this is a program that builds up over the course of 30 weeks, so on and so forth. Now, in my case, because my particular marathon is on December 10th of 2023, and as of recording this, it's April 22nd, and I'm nearly through the second week of the program, the reality is I have about 34 weeks until race day in terms of what I need to do to cover all of that time period between what I've already done and where I'll be on race day in terms of just raw days on the calendar. So really, I'm adding kind of a few weeks into this program. I'll talk about that a little bit. I've made some minor adjustments to this program, and this is where I'll, I'll probably start this video. In terms of the adjustments, really, I'm going to follow this program lockstep until about week 13, at which point in time, the only change that I'm making is from week 13 through 30, I am not going to be doing cross training. I will be doing... Um, some form of speed work up until the taper period of time. So I, I'll quickly show you how I'm doing that. It's very simple. I'm picking up where Hal leaves off. In through week kind of one through eh, roughly 11, he builds from 30 minutes of work for your speed work days up to about 45 minutes. And I'm just picking up from there. So you can see, you know, if we leave off at 45 minutes in week 11, now we're doing 50 uh, minutes of running from fart legs, 50 minutes of running for tempos. We're adding to the hill reps, so on and so forth. So the only thing that I'm getting rid of is the shorter intervals. I feel like from week seven to 12, you know, I'm getting in enough interval work that to me, that's where I'm working on some of that raw speed for some of the shorter distance races that you kind of prepare for during this program. At which point in time, I really want to then focus more on longer range speed efforts, given naturally that I'm running a marathon. Uh, while I do think there's some validity to running some shorter intervals, and maybe I'll even do some Yasso 800s just as kind of a time prediction type thing, even though I feel like that's a relatively imperfect predictor. Um, for now, I'm planning on just doing a, a kind of a rotation of one week being fartleks, one week being tempo runs, and one week being hills, and just repeating that kind of over and over again until week 27. So I'll peak out at about an hour of work in terms of kind of the amount of speed work I'm doing on that day. And then I'm slowly starting to kind of break that down until we get to the end there. So over my weekly kind of overview videos that you'll see in this program, you'll, you'll get a better delineation of that over time. But for now, I've just replaced the cross training days with some form of speed work. And I'll listen to my body. If I'm feeling too overtrained or I'm feeling like I'm taking a step back versus a step forward, then I can always replace that with easy running. But one of the things I had mentioned in that overview was, as I was thinking, yeah, I'm just going to make all of those days easy. And then as I looked at the program, I felt like, well, then I'll only really be doing every so often a race and some pace work. And that's just not going to be enough. I don't think the one kind of, you know, fallback of this program, I suppose for me is since I'm going from more advanced programs to a program that combines two intermediate level programs is I would say that this program for somebody who's run 40, 50, 60 mile weeks in their past, there's probably just not enough speed work there if you are someone who's trying to run the marathon a little bit faster. I think this is a great program for someone who's trying to, to truly have a personal best after a first or second you know, marathon, but somebody who hasn't run maybe a ton of miles, this could be a really good program for you. If you're someone like me who has run more advanced programs, you probably need to add in a little speed work. So that's personally what I'm doing. We'll see if that pans out. If it doesn't, I'll be the first to, to own that fact, okay? So that would be kind of the, the minor additions I've made to this program. Now, in terms of more kind of, I suppose, athlete specifics, first and foremost, I'll talk a little bit about heart rate zones because in my particular case, it, there's there's some give and take to the heart rate zone type training. I am not a huge slave to heart rate zones, to what my watch is saying. You know, I know that in some cases, the watch is really picking up more on cadence than truly your heart rate. 
So you don't want to get too married to the numbers that you're seeing. You just want to use them as an overall generalization of how you're doing on any given day. And in my particular case, most of my easy running, I want to keep in that kind of zone one and zone two range. For those of you who are less familiar with heart rate training and what that really means, that means you're doing about a 50% effort up to maybe about a 70% effort. That's what I would want to keep in my easy range. Okay. Now on my speed days, you're going to see me working somewhere between during the warm up and cool down phase about zone two and zone three, maybe even a little bit of zone four. Okay. And then in theory on the interval days, that's might be where we go really the whole gamut. You might see me start at zone two during warm up, peak all the way into zone four and zone five while I'm doing these shorter intervals. And then coming back down again to maybe the zone two range while I'm cooling down. So once again, I try not to get too worked up about this. Um, there's a, a really big caveat that I have to make. I actually talked about this in my week one overview video for the, the first week of the personal best program is that right now I'm, I'm kind of still a little bit in a weight loss phase. I, I'm right around 187 pounds. I like to be at about 185 pounds when I start training and then just let my body go to whatever it wants to go to by the end of the program. Uh, generally speaking, I, I don't want to toe the line for a race any more than 185 pounds. That's just my personal preference. Um, being someone who's 6'1", six, 6'2"-ish, six, that's pretty still pretty heavy for a runner. Um, but that's just what I feel best at. And so I don't want to kind of overdo it, but I let my body choose. And so most of the time I end up towing the line somewhere around 182 to 183. That just tends to be where my body, you know, finds its natural weight, I suppose. So right now, because I'm still focused on burning a little bit of fat and I'm using stimulants like caffeine and yohimbine, the, the issue is, is that that data in terms of what my heart rate will look on something, for example, like run lies, where you're looking at the averaged out heart rate over the course of a run, it's going to look a lot higher than, you know, really kind of potentially really what it is. So for a really perfect example of this is this week, one of the runs, I was kind of like hustling to, to get back to the house because I, I had used the restroom not to get to, to TMI, but I just had to go to the bathroom. And so at the end of this particular run, you can see I was keeping it very slow, right around the nine minute on average pace. But because I was running a little bit quicker to get home to use the restroom, my heart rate spiked. And so it brought up my average heart rate quite a bit, even though my pace wasn't all that fast over the course of the run. So it made my VO2 max look like it went way down in comparison to a prior run. So this is the point that I'm getting at, that it gets kind of, you, you can end up having it get a little silly if you get too worried about what zone you're in, how that, you know, equates to a VO2 max. I really feel like you have to do this on a day-by-day -day basis. You have to feel, you know, kind of what, how am I doing today? Did I, you know, you know, in, in my feeling as, as a runner, as you continue to progress, you get to a point where you know that was a good run or that wasn't a very good run, or I could have done this or that better. No harm, no foul. We, we go through all of that, those different ranges when we're running. So I, tr as I always say, I try not to be a slave to this data, but I do use it as a way to just get a general kind of massaged feeling. If we massage that data, a generalized feeling of how I'm progressing over the course of a week, a month in a training program. Okay. So that's the kind of where I'm starting is that I'm trying to keep the easy running in zone one, zone two, keep the, the medium intensity speed work type days in zone three or four, and then ultimately, you know, some of the, the more intense shorter interval type work or even chunks of fartlek runs might go into zone four and zone five. Um, once again, don't get too worried about this early data for me because it's going to be all over the place because of caffeine, you know, imbine. Once it kicks into your system, your heart rate's all over the map. So it's, it's really kind of imperfect data for this particular point in time. Now, one of the things that I'm also doing during this time is somehow it, it always works out that as I'm starting to do marathon training, my wife decides, well, now I want to start working out again with you. And can you do something with me, some type of program with me? And we um, we have a child, so we have a little one at home. And so we can only, you know, really fit so much kind of workout time within a day. And so my wife kind of got into the insanity, high intensity interval training program uh, many moons ago when we were in college together. And we've done it off and on ever since. And this is what she likes to do when she wants to lose a little bit of weight and, and kind of tone up 
for the summer. And so I'm doing this with her in conjunction, um, well, I should say in conjunction with the running that I'm already doing. So I've talked about this before. I view it as kind of an adjunctive training. It does really help build up a lot of body weight um, type of work that you're doing in terms of not truly a weight training, but some muscle development, muscular development might be a better way of putting it, really a muscular endurance in my opinion. What I like about this program is you're doing a lot of body weight squats. You're doing a lot of, a lot of body weight pushups, um, a lot of plank and core work. Um, gosh, I mean, really the whole body gets worked out in this program. And so for me, what I find is if I'm smart and I'm not overdoing the exercises, I tend to get a good response from this in terms of a recovery because there's a lot of stretching involved. So I usually feel a little bit stronger on this program. I'm not advocating you add a HIIT workout in conjunction, like a HIIT workout program in conjunction with marathon training. I think that's probably not always the smartest plan, especially if you're maybe more in that novice to intermediate range of runner. But for me, as someone who does like to include a lot of weightlifting in his running, in terms of the overall body of training work that I'm doing, this is something that I am doing in conjunction with all of that. And in, in really in conjunction with Insanity, I am also doing uh, kind of a dumbbell-based weight training program where I'm doing all sorts of compound lifts from a military press where you're pressing upwards, rows where you're working your back, bench press naturally to work your chest. Um, some, some calf raises, some uh, weighted squats, weighted deadlifts, things of that nature. So pretty basic and straightforward weightlifting, all very relatively low weight where I'm just doing a lot of reps for muscular endurance and a little bit of muscular development because might as well add that in there, I suppose. Now, in terms of kind of some of the supplementation in diet, I've talked about this before. I'm someone who actually really believes that supplementation can be very, very beneficial. And I'm talking about this from kind of a legal supplementation standpoint. So I try to make sure that I'm getting in a few different things. One, I try to make sure that I'm getting in magnesium for muscle recovery, calcium to make sure that I'm keeping the likelihood of bone injury lower because I don't eat a lot of dairy products. I don't really even drink milk. It's just something I've lost the taste for over time. While I do eat cheeses and things of that nature, I don't get enough of it day by day. So I do take a calcium and magnesium supplement to support that. I generally take a vitamin C supplement as well in some form, uh, whether it's a tablet or a powder. And I do that because I just don't frankly eat enough fruits. I eat a lot of vegetables. I don't eat a lot of fruits. I should, I should change that, uh, but it's just kind of a personal taste thing. I find that fruits just taste too sweet to me. So I generally do supplement with vitamin C. In terms of some of the things that help with my recovery, you know, I'm a male at the age of 32 at this point. I'm going to turn 33 this year. So naturally, I'm facing kind of that downhill battle with testosterone. So I do like to take some things that have even, even if they're a trepidatious connection, there's some connection there to testosterone boosting. So I take Silagit for that reason. Um, I take Chia Seed. Uh, for the ALAs, which are essentially omega-3s, plant-based omega-3s to help a little bit with inflammation. Same thing with turmeric. I'm taking that for inflammation purposes, inflammation reduction purposes, I should say. And then biotin is really for my wife. And then I'm also trying this year collagen for joint health. Now, I, I can't report back that any of these have helped. I don't have any joint pain, but they're always things that I've used as kind of, uh, they're not hurting Maybe they're helping type thing and they don't cost me all that much money. This is basically almost a year's supply worth of supplements, which you can see came out to, to roughly about 60 bucks. So those are the supplements that I'm taking right now. The only other thing that you don't see here is um, protein powder. I'm generally taking about 50 grams of protein powder per day, uh, at least when I remember to take it. And I'm usually taking one heaping teaspoonful of psyllium husk, which is fiber just to help keep me regular. So that's generally kind of how I, I run my diet. In terms of the, the actual food itself, I heavily focus on lean protein. So some type of either pork, chicken, beef, or fish, vegetables, and rice. I'm pretty much that boring five to six days a week. And then usually one or two days a week, my wife and I will go out to eat with our family or we'll kind of you know get a bunch of snacks for the house if there's a big boxing match on or a big basketball game or something. And we'll We'll, we'll kind of let loose and have a little bit of fun. The only thing I would add to this is personally right now, I'm not drinking alcohol through the entirety of the Insanity program, which would be roughly about a 10-week program. 
So I'd be about the thir first third of my marathon training program. If I feel like that's helping me, I will pretty much stay off of alcohol all the way through the marathon if, if I feel like that's of any benefit. If not, then I might have a beer or two on Saturdays, but nothing all that crazy in my opinion. Okay, so that would be kind of what I'm doing for the diet perspective. In terms of shoes, I've gotten this as a question before in the past. Well, what do I wear? I generally wear whatever's cheapest, to be honest with you. And so I, I have three shoes this year that I'll be using. The first would be for primarily my easy runs um, or shorter long runs. I will be using the Reebok Energin Plus. This was a shoe that I picked up last year because it was super, super cheap. I got it for like 35 bucks on the internet. I bought a couple of pairs and I found that I really liked them. Um, they're pretty simplistic shoes. As you can see, kind of they're a really basic running shoe. The upper is a synthetic upper that's pretty breathable. The, the Fuel Foam Foam is pretty squishy and it has kind of a, a comfort-based insert that I feel feels really good on my foot. I think it's a good daily trainer for that type of run. You're running that kind of three to eight mile range, but I've gone all the way up to 12, 13, 14 miles in the shoe and felt fine. Now, the only thing that I will say is that I disagree that it's not for wide feet. In fact, I feel like there is some slippage in this feet. I am someone who has very wide feet and very big feet. I'm a size 13. And I feel like I'm swimming in this shoe at the size 13. So it, it feels probably a half size big. So if you're someone who does have interest in this shoe, you're probably going to be able to find it at like your local JC Penney's. That's where I found this shoe the first time after buying it on the internet. I just walked to my local JC Penney's near my home and I found a whole wall of them just sitting there ready to be purchased. And they are 35 bucks there as well. Not just on Amazon. I found that they've been basically $35 everywhere I've gone. So they're a super duper cheap shoe. They're not all that visually um, aesthetically pleasing, I suppose, but they're a good kind of get the job done shoe. I wouldn't use them for trail running. I wouldn't use them for significant hill efforts, but if you're running a relatively flat, fast type of training course, I think this shoe would meet your needs. So it's something to consider in terms of you're looking for. And I think the pros and cons here listed on run repeat are about as accurate as you can get. It is a very light shoe, and it actually, I found has been pretty durable. I'm actually on my third pair right now. So I've put almost 1,500 miles into three different pairs of these shoes and I've had zero issues with them. So I, I would say in terms of, if you trust me, you can trust this shoe. Uh, a new shoe that I literally just ran in today and really, I, I'm actually now a huge fan of is the Saucony Freedom 4. Now, I personally got this shoe uh, for more speed-based workouts. So today I did like a three by hill workout with them where I was running very fast and I felt like it handled that workout really, really well. My understanding is this shoe was kind of created as a fills in all the gap type shoe. It's a shoe that you could use for running. It's a shoe you could use to go in the gym in, walk around in. It's not meant to be the greatest shoe. It's probably a little bit better than their cohesion or grid line type thing and a little bit less than their endorphin line. It's kind of a mid-tier type shoe. Now, I do think that the top pro there of it being insanely comfortable is correct to a point. I find that it is very tight in the midfoot, even when I adjusted the laces. It kind of, it has a very uh, breathable upper, but I feel like it's kind of tight and plasticky in the middle. So even though it breathes well, I still feel like it's really tight around the midfoot and that could just be because I have huge feet. That might not really be a problem for you. Uh, I do find it it does run relatively true to size, and I did not have any heels, heel slippage at all. So that's where I would absolutely disagree with this. I also don't think it's a very stiff ride. I think it's actually a semi-plush ride. The middle of it has um, kind of that, um, that power run foam. I, I don't know the exact term for it there. But it's, it's kind of that, it's very similar to the Adidas Boost type technology in the middle there. And it has a more traditional kind of um, rubber uh, outsole to it. So it, it has good dur durability. Um, I don't, I, another area I would really disagree with, I think it has a, it's going to have a serious break in period. I would guess 50 to 100 miles is when this shoe is going to actually start to feel really, really good. I feel, feel like it feels good now. It's going to feel great soon. So if, once again, if you're looking for a shoe that's pretty cheap in that $30 to $40 range, at least for my size, uh, this could be another shoe worth considering because 
I've at least through one run, you never want to fully, you know, give your, your blessing after one run, but after one run, I will say, I really, really like this shoe so far. So eight miles into it, I'm a fan. And then my last shoe that I put maybe about 70 miles on, it wasn't my purchase. My wife bought these for me was the Hoka Challenger 6 um, kind of all-terrain shoe ATR. And uh, she got it at the time for $60. It's showing for about 90 to 100 here. But she was able to find a pair at REI on the internet for about 65 bucks, I think. And I would agree with, once again, most of the pros here. It is very much so true to size. Pretty darn comfortable shoe. Fit securely. I've had zero issues with it. And it does work pretty well if you're running on a mixture of kind of hilly, um, gravelly type surfaces or more like fire roads. I think it's a great shoe for that. I use this when I do hill workouts near where I work because there's a lot of fire roads back there that you can run. And with the of the previous two shoes that I showed, I feel like you'd have a lot of slippage issues, um, really just, you know, in terms of traction with the ground. And I don't want that. I don't want to take a dive and hurt myself. So these shoes have been great for that. Now, where I would totally agree with is it does lack pop. I, I don't feel particularly fast. I don't feel particularly slow in the shoe. It just doesn't feel all that engaging when I'm trying to pick up the pace. That would be the best way that I could put it. It says that it can't be used for technical terrain. I have no idea. I'm not someone who would be running on technical terrain. So that's kind of a your mileage will vary type thing. So those are the shoes that I'm wearing. And I have found that overall, so far, I'm very happy with my shoe rotation. I'm keeping it super simple this year, which is the daily trainer, a faster shoe, and a shoe that can handle more extreme hills and um, non-road-based surfaces. That's essentially what I'm looking at in my shoe rotation right now. So by and large, I would say that is the majority of kind of the overviews that I would give you to this program in terms of how I'm using it, what I'm using, kind of things outside of the marathon training program that still impact the marathon program. The only minor thing I will add now is that I talked about this a bit in the week one overview video. I pretty much this year have done nothing but base building, a little bit of vertical gain running, at some times picking up the pace a little bit, but by and large, I've just been running a lot of miles. And so in January, I ran about 130 miles. In February, I think I ran about 130, so 130. And then in March, I ran another 131 miles. In April so far, I think I've run close to about 100. And I would say about 60-ish of it was base building prior to starting the Hal Higdon Personal Best training program. So that comes up to about 450 miles of just relative base building. So my base is very well built, in my opinion, and I feel confident in how I'm running. I think that was a benefit. It, I, I probably still wouldn't go into this program without setting your own base first. And I think my largest week leading up to the program was about 50 miles, if I'm remembering correctly. So I had a good mixture there of about 30 to 50 mile weeks, varying distances there, as we, I said before, a lot of flat running, but usually about one or two uh, runs that had a, a, a more significant amount of vertical gain, at least in the types of runnings that I'm doing over here uh, on the Monterey Peninsula area here in California. So that would be the, the one other addendum I would make to this training program is I do think even though this is a program where it seems like Hal is trying to build you up from a relative low mileage to probably about 50-ish miles based on how I'm running the program, I would say you probably still want to do a little bit of base building before you start this program and be consistently running 30 to 40 mile weeks before you take this on. That would just be what I would recommend. Okay. So overall, that's what I'm doing or will be doing throughout the program. And I will keep you all updated week by week in terms of how the program is going. Uh, but for now, if you have any questions about the program, do let me know. Otherwise, I hope your training is going well and take care.